I'm Kate Thorley, the CEO at Wilson Asset Management. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome you all here today. And I want to thank you all for being here. We hold these presentations twice a year around all the capital cities, and we get to see and meet and have a cup of tea and give you an update. Uh, almost sort of 2,000 shareholders, so it's, um, it's wonderful to have so many of you here today. This is the disclaimer. Obviously, we can't provide uh, uh, personal financial advice. And just bear in mind, when we talk about stocks, uh, obviously the market's very dynamic and our view of a stock can change overnight. So just bear that in mind. The, the agenda for today, I'll talk to you a little bit about Wilson Asset Management. I'll then pass over to Jeff Wilson uh, to take you through how we manage your capital. Um, he'll also give you an update on each of the four listed investment companies that we manage for you. The investment team will then uh, present to you about their views on the stock market, both domestically and, and globally, and then also talk to you about the investment portfolio and give you some insights into a stock story that's worked, a stock that hasn't worked, and a couple of stocks that we like at the moment. We'll then close the meeting with um, some questions, and this, this time round we're doing a facilitated uh, Q&A. Alex Hopper, our senior communications advisor, is going to uh, run through that, some, some of the common questions that uh, shareholders sent in when you uh, provided us with your RSVPs. So thank you very much uh, for doing that. And then we'll also take questions from the floor. So about us. Uh, Jeff's already mentioned um, during his chairman's address, but at Wilson Asset Management, our purpose is to make a difference, and that's to make a difference, firstly, to our shareholders uh, through uh, providing you with financial returns, but also in how we engage and communicate with you. And uh, myself and the team at Wilson Asset Management spend a, a huge amount of time uh, engaging with shareholders and, and really wanting to make a difference to your lives. So um, that's just a, a big part of our culture. The other way that we make a difference is the continued support that we give uh, the future generation vehicles uh, that we uh, created or Jeff created over the course of the last three years. And we're very proud of the support that we give those vehicles. Um, the investment team are managing uh, part of FGX, uh, part of their capital on a pro bono basis. Uh, we offer corporate affairs support and um, also finance and administrative support. So I'd encourage uh, you all to stay for the presentations on those vehicles which are following lunch today. The other way that we make a difference to the broader community is uh, through the uh, Pledge 1%. It's a, a global movement that we signed up to in the last year. It's where companies uh, pledge to give away either 1% of uh, profit, 1% of product, or 1% of their employees' time. And so uh, Jeff's already mentioned today, but we are committed to allowing the team to give their time to various causes of which we're passionate about. And we also get together as a team and go out into the community and help various causes. And we've got a, a day uh, next month. We're all going out to Mount Druitt uh, to a community centre and we're doing a bit of a backyard blitz style um, event where we're, we're giving, giving our time to, to help a community out there. Our team, this is myself and the investment team, led by Chris Stott, our Chief Investment Officer, a very passionate and talented group of individuals. We've been very fortunate this year uh, to uh, have hired John Ayub, who was uh, previously with Credit Suisse. Uh, John's a senior equity analyst and uh, focuses on WAM leaders, uh, together with Matt Haupt. Uh, we've also hired Oscar Oberg, who is an equity analyst and joined us from CSLA. Uh, so we've been uh, very fortunate uh, to have uh, two new additions to the team. In total, though, there's, there's 20 of us based here in Sydney, and that's uh, corporate affairs, the accountants and the finance team, and uh, the operations team. So uh, there are quite a few of us 
from the office here today, um, so hopefully you'll get to, to meet some of the team. I'll now hand over to Jeff, if he's back, oh, yeah, oh, here. to take you through how we manage your capital. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I was just showing the follow, following shareholder. I was streaming you on the iPhone. I thought it was uh, technology. Very exciting for us old people, isn't it? In terms of how we, how we invest money, what we're trying to do is we're trying to buy undervalued growth companies and only buy them when we can see a catalyst that's going to change the valuation. A and we spend, um, this is Chris, uh, myself and the team, and the seven of us, and as an investment team, we are quite large you know, in terms of numbers for the size of funds we manage. Um, but we spend all our time meeting with companies, trying to understand how those companies make money. Um, and it's only by understanding how those companies make money, then we can forecast what the earnings of the companies could be. Um, and then we can come up with a valuation and then we can identify what we believe is a catalyst that will change the valuation of the company. Because what we'd prefer um, to do is sit in cash and take no risk and only buy a company when we see a catalyst. Now, a, a simple catalyst is a positive earning surprise. Um, or it could be a, a structural change in the industry, you know, which um, an example of that was in Blackmores, where we saw what was, was happening in Asia um, you know, when we bought the shares at $47. Um, and then there can be, or it could be a management change, anything that we believe is going to revalue the company or, or re-rate the company in, in the market's eyes. So that's what we're, that is the main focus on, on what we're trying to do. Buy undervalued growth companies, but only buy them when we can see a catalyst, otherwise sit in cash. And while we're sitting in cash, because we're, um, well, we're called institutions or you know, fund managers, we get access to a lot of things that the, 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 usual, the normal retail investor doesn't get access to, whether it's um, IPOs, um, and because of our size, we, we get significantly better access now than we used to get. Um, and and we, will, we will sometimes meet with companies that are going to IPO a year, or, a year or so before they come to market and may meet the management four or five times over that period. Because for us, management is incredibly important. Because just as you buy shares in the companies we manage, you do that because you believe we'll perform and you trust us. When we buy shares in a company, we do it because we believe the managing director is going to perform for us and we trust them. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. But when we're sitting in cash, then we look for any opportunities. And that's, that's, that's called the market-driven part of the portfolio. So the undervalued growth companies with the catalyst, that's the research driven part of the portfolio. And as you'll see by the slide, um, that WAM Capital is a combination of undervalued growth companies with a catalyst and market-driven, which is trading. Uh, and so is WAM Leaders, and, but that's focused on mainly the top 200. And then WAM Research is a pure play on those undervalued growth companies with a catalyst and WAM Active is a pure play on the, on the trading part of the portfolio. Um, in terms of looking at the, the, the four listed investment companies that, that we manage, WAM Capital being the largest, the, the NTA you see, the last month's NTA was a little under $2, um, and the share price is you know, two, was at $29, $2.30. So it's trading at, at a big premium to NTA. Now, we as an, as an investor, I only like buying things at a discount to NTA. 
And to me, the bigger the discount I can buy them at, the better. Um, so the, the only thing that sort of, the only way I've got tripped up on this one is, I remember it was nearly about 10 years ago, a shareholder ringing up, we're trading at a 10% premium to NTA, and he said, hey Jeff, I'm interested in buying some shares, and I sort of went through, look, we're trying to buy things at a discount to NTA, why would you pay above what we're worth? And he said, look, answer me one thing, do you believe you can outperform the market by 1% per annum over 10 years? Um, hey, and if he's here in the audience, please come up to me later. Because, uh, um, and, and I said I'd be incredibly disappointed if we couldn't. And that would still be my view. You know, could we, if you're taking a 10-year view, could we, do you think we can outperform the market by 1.5 per cent over the next 10 years? I'd be incredibly disappointed if we couldn't. If you're saying, oh, it's a five-year view, could we do by 3 per cent? Well, we're planning on doing better than 3 per cent. That's what we hope. Uh, or plan on. If it's a two-year view, could we outperform by 7.5%? Now, that's tough. That's really tough. Um, but anyway, you know, WAM Capital is expensive. It's trading at a premium in NTA. Um, the, um, the dividend, you can, it, it's giving you a good dividend yield. Our ability to keep paying dividends is really how do we pay dividends? The dividends are a function of the dividends we receive from companies we invest in but also it's any profit we make. And at the moment we're 40, uh, well, we're 58% we're, uh, invested, 42% cash, and that changes a lot. You know, we, we were 98% we were invested at one point in time over the last 17 years, um, and we were 70% cash um, before the end of the GFC. So it does move around quite a bit. The, um, but our ability to pay dividends is the dividends we receive from the companies we invest in plus any profit we make. At the moment in our profit reserve, we've got a little over 24 cents. So if the dividend go, uh, is like that or goes up fractionally, like we've got the next year and a half and a bit of the following year. But we need to make money again over the next two years to keep paying your dividends. Um, in terms of WAM leaders, you know, it's, it's only trading a little bit of a premium. You know, obviously, it's just started. So uh, in terms of paying a dividend, it's, it's got at the moment 2.72 cents in the profit reserve. A and I'm just one of, the, one of the directors. But if we're having a, a board meeting today worrying, talking about what dividend will we pay for the next 12 months, we try to, whatever we pay in the interim, we try to pay in the full year. So you'd probably... 2.7, you'd probably pay a, a one cent interim and a one cent full year. Now, that can change ve very uh, significantly because if the, um, between now and February, WAM leaders, and, and I know, you know the WAM leaders' portfolio is up this month, and so the more money will go into the profit reserve. If you know, the, there's a lot more money in the profit reserve, then that's a different decision the board will you know, make on dividends in February. In terms of the you know, long-term view on dividends, obviously the bigger companies are yielding more, so we'll get more flow-through dividends from those, uh, but also we'll be enhancing the dividends with any, any profit we make. So the plan would be over time, now WAM's been going for a long time, so it's, it's built up a profit reserve. The plan would be over time to have a yield you know, approaching WAM Capital's yield. That would be the plan. So it's, and your yield is a combination of flow-through dividends uh, and uh, profit we make, realised profit. WAM Research, again, trading at a premium DNTA. That's the yield. The yield's a little bit lower than WAM Capital. The plan would be the... Um, well, WAM Research has about 37 cents in the profit reserve, so 4.3 years if the dividend's maintained where it is. So there's a big profit reserve. And the plan would be, um, in the, in the, probably the, in the next year or two, to get it yielding about the same as WAM Capital. But that'll probably be done over a couple of years. That, now, that's yield on the asset value. That's what we look at. Um, the share price, you guys decide the share price. Uh, WAM Active, uh, a couple of years ago, couldn't pay a dividend. It's now in its, uh, trading at a slight, you know, a bit of a slight premium in NTA. You've got to remember there's an option issue in, in WAM Active. Um, 
So that's potentially dilutionary once the NTA goes above the exercise price. Um, but the plan is to gently increase the dividend again. Uh, and we've got a little over eight cents in the profit reserve there. So probably a year and a half of dividends. Now I'd just like to pass over to Chris who will take you through the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Is there a correction coming to the title of this slide? Well, yes, we do think there is a correction coming. We're, we're, we think it will be some point in the next few years. And it's very, very hard. No one ever knows when they'll come and when they'll arrive. And it'd be silly to stand here and say when we think that it could arrive. What we can deal with are the facts. And that the facts are that we're now around seven years into this bull market. That compares to the average duration of a bull market of around five and a half years. And you go back and look at the last 50 to 100 years of how the share market here in Australia and the US has traded. We're going through this period, as Jeff said earlier, of record low interest rates. They're, they're not having as much of an impact in terms of stimulating the economy as what we've seen in previous cycles. Unemployment rates remain steady. We, we, we can talk about house prices shortly. We think the housing market's peaked. What we think, we're, out, we're of the view that we have finished the loosening cycle in terms of interest rates. We do not think there'll be another interest rate cut. The cash rate today sitting at 1.5% is an all-time record low. Uh, it has stimulated some parts of the economy, like housing, retail to a lesser extent, but nowhere near as much as we said when you compare it to previous cycles. So we actually think the next move in interest rates will be up. We don't think it will be for another one to three years. We think that the data we're seeing that's been reported in the last few months in particular has, has shown very, very small signs of improvement in terms of uh, inflation, a little bit more inflation coming back into the system, GDP growth starting to slowly trend up. The resources uh, downturn has finished over in WA, so the fiscal hit we're going to get to our budget position is going to be quite large if the price of iron ore in particular holds up where it is today at around $75 a tonne. So we think that the next movement in interest rates will be up. And, and coming back to the, 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 the heading on the slide, is there a correction coming? What we tend to find is that equity markets after one or two interest rate rises tend to struggle. They tend to underperform. You, you want to be normally invested in the share market when interest rates are on the way down. And you might say, well, interest rates are going up for a good reason because economic growth is slowly returning to more normal levels. We've gone through this abnormal phase pro post the GFC, particularly in Australia, where we've had uh, below trend economic growth now for many, many years. The deleveraging in this is still occurring. We're still seeing consumers paying down their debts, paying down their credit cards at a rapid rate. Uh, to try and clean up their own balance sheets. So we think that, a little bit counter consensus, we think the next move in interest rates will be higher. And as such, that could present a, a more negative outlook uh, for the share market. And as Jeff said back in the AGM, and for some of you who weren't here, uh, we are concerned around how this all ends, this era of, of uh, cheap money, that's money printing that's occurred for many, many years now uh, right around the world. There's, there's no playbook, there's no, um, there's no precedent for how, how, uh, how it all ends. And with the, uh, with the money printing now slowing uh, in various parts of the world, uh, that's another point that we're watching very, very closely. Will small caps continue to outperform? We don't think so. For WAM Capital, WAM Research and WAM Active, they are typically focused on investing in small to mid caps stocks, as you know, whereas WAM Leaders focuses on only the top 200 stocks. The small caps have had a very good period. If you look at this chart here, you can see, particularly in the last year or so, the, the light blue line being the small ordinaries index. When compared to the ASX 100, which is the dark blue line, you can see that the small, the small ordinaries index which has had a very, very good period. And if you break that down even further and look in the, inside the small ordinaries index, the composition of that index, the, the small industrials have had an even better experience uh, in the last two years in particular. So w why do we think that the small caps will continue to underperform? Will, will, will underperform from here, and that's, it's already started. We've noted particularly the last two to three months that the small caps have started to significantly underperform the, the larger counterparts. We're seeing valuations across the small cap market as being very, very high. The small industrials at around 18 times price to earnings ratio. That compares to 17 times that we saw at the top of the market in 2007, so we've gone beyond that. More importantly, though, we're not seeing the earnings per share growth coming through from these companies to justify these high multiples. And until we can see that where we get more confidence in particular um, for, on the revenue lines for, from companies showing real earnings growth, that could potentially um, give us some more confidence uh, on the small cap end of the market. Anecdotally, uh, we've seen the, the 
the quality of uh, IPOs that we're being presented with uh, is, is a lot less than what it was in the last 12 months or even two years. We've seen a lot of IPOs being pulled uh, in the last few months in particular or being postponed until the new year. And the ones that actu have actually got away have traded um, you know, only fairly, uh, either trading broadly in line with their issue price or in, in some instances you know, a fair way below the issue price in a short space of time. So we are being quite selective at the moment in terms of the small cap IPOs that we are looking to participate in. And, and, and some of the valuations on some of these companies has been a little bit too, too high for us. Has the housing market peaked? This chart shows you we think that it has. And this chart goes back to 1983. It's from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. You can see there that housing approvals have started to come off their highs. Uh, you can see there over the last six or 12 months, we've had record low interest rates in Australia for many, many years now, stimulated particularly uh, the East Coast uh, housing market. When you take a step back and look at the, the full housing market picture in Australia, uh, there are, the Sydney and Melbourne markets are by far and away the strongest from a residential property perspective. Those two respective markets would be up anywhere from 30 to 40 per cent in the last two to three years. When we start to see residential property returns, outstrip the share market, we do get a little bit concerned. And that's what we've seen in the last few years. And that's been really fueled by record low interest rates. As a whole, though, around the country, we've been really, really poor at adding supply. We haven't been building enough supply, particularly standalone homes, the, the, you know, the old three-bedroom bedroom brick home, in the last decade or two to keep up with the population growth, which is approaching 25 million now in Australia. So one pocket of the housing market that we are very, very cautious about are the, is the apartment space. And for, for us here in Sydney today, you, you only have to drive around you know, some of your main arterial roads uh, in, in this city to realise that there are new apartment blocks being put up uh, every, all the time. And particularly developers are on the hunt for, for land, in particular on main roads uh, in Sydney, where they're approaching a group of... Uh, uh, a, a group of uh, house owners to try and get them to sell all at once to, to, to build a, uh, a high-rise apartment block. So there is an enormous amount of supply being added at the moment in the apartment space and we think that that warrants caution. We're hearing stories talking to some of the major banks that, norm that as usual, they are very restrictive in terms of uh, where, who they lend to and in particular they've got a, a blacklist of postcodes that they will not give you a home loan to buy a property in, and that list has started to increase. Suburbs like Chatswood here in Sydney, where there's an enormous amount of uh, supply of apartments being built and continue to be built, or whether you look at places like Docklands in Melbourne, where you're seeing a similar phenomenon down there. So the banks are being far more restrictive in terms of their lending on the apartment space and also the LVRs that they offer on those loans. So we, do, we, are, we are warranting caution on that apartment space over the next few years in terms of the supply that's been added uh, to, to the system. And as a result, you can assume from this that we don't own any housing-related uh, companies in the portfolio uh, like we did a few years ago, like CSR or, or Brickworks, or ones that are highly levered to, uh, you know, to a, an improving uh, housing market. Is the era of cheap money ending? Yes, it is. As we said before, we've seen this uh, enormous stimulus added into the system, particularly in Europe and the US from money printing, trying to buy their way out of, uh, through the GFC, which, which is, we, we'll look back in hindsight and we'll only be able to judge once we go through another cycle how it actually, was it the right decision or not. Um, but you can see here that the, the, we put the 10-year bond rates on there. What we've noticed more recently are the yields on these 10-year bonds have started to rally quite dramatically, suggesting to us that the, the movement, well, predicting that interest rates are going higher. We think, and not only here in Australia, but right around the world, interest rates will move higher over the next decade, particularly in the US economy, where you're seeing signs of more, you know, quite strong growth starting to appear post the GFC period, uh, where they went through a, uh, a recession. Uh, we've seen uh, the last, last set of quarterly earnings results come out from companies over in the US have been quite positive. Uh, we're seeing their housing market return uh, to, more positive, uh, to more positive levels. So, so the, US, the US economy looks in a really good position um, as, as we go forward over the next few years. Uh, in terms of the, the, the money printing, we don't know how that's going to end. And as for us as investors, 
that creates a little bit of concern for us. Um, and, and really it's something that we're going to be watching very, very closely because what's been happening is all these equity prices and other asset classes have been inflated to, in some cases to artificially high levels. Uh, and and what we're, as we're going through this period now of this quantitative e uh, easing, unwinding, uh, we, we'll get more evidence of, uh, of, of what the full impact or not will be as we, as we return to more, uh, hopefully, more normal economic conditions, not only in Australia, but right around the world. The outcome of the US election, President Donald Trump. Now, people either laugh when I say that or they gasp and they take a deep breath. This caught the market clearly by surprise. When we saw you last time in May, there were two big events coming up over the following six months. The first one was, was Brexit, and the second one was where we knew we were going to have an election over in the US. Now, the odds were that, that, the, uh, that they would have elected to stay in the EU and that Hillary Clinton would be the next president of the United States. We got it wrong. The share market got it wrong. The, booking, the, the, the sports betting agencies got it wrong. Uh, you could have put a bet on... Uh, on the US election, even the day before it, on Donald Trump to be the next president at five to one. So most people got it wrong. And in terms of, so that's the history. Um, what have we got now in front of us? What, is, what does a Trump-led uh, government mean for us as investors in the share market over the next few years is the real question. And, and for us at the moment, all we can deal with are the facts. What we can note is that we've seen enormous, well, it becoming a large rally uh, in the share market post the election of Donald Trump, where we've seen recovery in share markets up more north of 5% in the last few weeks and continuing to make record highs. We saw the Dow Jones overnight uh, break through that 19,000 level for the first time in its history, so continuing to make record highs. What the market is saying to us is that on a net basis that, that, that Donald Trump's policies are a net beneficiary for economic growth in the US over the next few years. Policies like tax cuts, uh, we've, he's talked about the potential removal or rollback of Obamacare. What remains to be seen, however, is what, what, which of these policies actually do get enacted. And he will, he will be sworn in on the 20th of January, uh, and, and over those following few months, we'll be watching very, very closely to see which of these policies uh, do get through. But in a, in a, in a, in a net basis, if, they, if a lot of them do get through, we would expect it to be stimulatory uh, for the US economy. Uh, over the next one to five years. Um, we, we've also talked about the TPP deal being abolished, uh, being a negative for us here in Australia, given that the Americans and the Chinese represent about a third of global trade, and the Chinese are our biggest trading partner as well here in Australia. That's so, so certainly that's one thing that he has made a point of saying, is that that will not go ahead, um, which, is, which is in its current form is a, is a negative for us here uh, as investors in Australia. So. What essentially has it done for us as investors with Donald Trump being elected as president? The level of risk we see uh, to be invested in the market now over the next few years has potentially gone up a little bit. Um, I, I, I do note Donald Trump's um, uh, 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 winning speech. Uh, it, was qu it was quite, and for those of you who saw it, he spoke very, very differently. It was like a completely hearing from a completely different person. And if we can have that throughout the next few years, I think we'll take that. <laughs> Um, some people are very much um, are fearful and uncertain, and we understand those, those uh, emotions in terms of what a Trump-led government does mean for the, for the US market and also for the Australian market. So, um, but essentially, um, what we've got now uh, is clarity. We've got, we've got the, the, the Brexit's being done. That will unfold in front of us over the next few years. Could take longer than what people, some, some people may expect. And we've now got clarity on who the president is. So a lot of unknowns that we had six months ago have now, have now been um, cleared away for, uh, for us as investors. What I'll do now is I'll hand it over to Matt Haupt, Portfolio Manager, to talk about some investment themes and trends and some of the key stock holdings in our four LICs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, and good morning, everybody. Chris touched on some of the macro issues in the uh, current economic environment at the moment. I'll run through some themes we've seen, and then I'll run through some of our top holdings, and then I'll pass over to John Ayub, who'll run through and kick off the stock stories. So the first slide here is around the rise of the self-managed super fund and what, what that means uh, for potential equity investments. You can see here how significant that 
self money to super fund space has become over the recent years. And I'm, all, I'm sure there'd be a huge amount of people in here with the self managed super funds. So we look to how do you get exposure in equity investments? How do you get exposure to this growth area? We'll put a couple of um, stocks down the bottom there, which were both, uh, both WAM Capital, WAM Active, WAM Research, and, and WAM Leaders have, have positions in, um, Class and Link. Link um, has exposure to growing super funds, and they have a very significant market share. They have around 70% market share um, in the super space. So we think this company, over the next few years, has the ability to consolidate um, as they continue to take member accounts. So this, this company, we still think, has got tremendous opportunity. They're currently um, under an ACCC um, process because they're trying to acquire this business called Pillar. So we think if they get Pillar, it will give them a great advantage going forward and there's a lot of synergies to come out here. So the play for Link for us is around getting their margins up their margins have been depressed as they take acquisitions on, then they actually get margin improvement when they get through these businesses and streamline them. So we think this company has tremendous opportunity going forward. The other one there, Class. Class we were invested in quite early. Class is a company which gives software for accountants to help them manage self-managed super funds. So it gives them all their reporting and all the back-end systems to make their job easier. It's had a tremendous run. Um, we took some profit on this stock because it had such a terrific run. Um, it still looks quite expensive up here if you look, look forward, but um, it's a company we're monitoring quite closely. And again, if you want direct leverage um, to self-managed super funds, this is, this is a good stock, but valuation-wise, it looks quite expensive. But that's probably the main areas you can gain access to the self-managed super fund growth through these type companies. The next slide here is around cashless society and online shopping. Also, this is a huge trend at the moment. Uh, like my, like um, a lot of people out there, they don't carry cash around. I don't carry cash around. I've got cards, and you can even pay with your mobile phone now. So it's, again, we're trying to look how do you leverage this trend into investment opportunities. So on this slide, down the bottom there, we've put all the um, areas we can get exposure. We have holdings in all these companies, except for Zip Money. The major banks, of course, they've got exposure to this, but it's really not going to move their earnings. Banks generate all their returns, well, majority of their returns from the net interest margin through um, lending money, around 60 to 70 per cent of earnings. So you won't get leverage uh, to this trend through the major banks, but one you can get a lot of leverage through is um, Afterpay. So Afterpay is a relatively new company, it's a company that gives you the ability to do online lay-by. So you can go online. If you, you don't have the cash to pay for it now, you can pay over three or four months, whatever period you'd like, um, generally a, a shortish period. So this has been a, a company that's had massive growth. And the reason why it's had massive growth is the online shopping area. So companies we've talked to that have implemented Afterpay have seen online sales tick up by 40 to 50% post implementing Afterpay. So it's a terrific system. If you're a retailer, it's just another um, access you can put on your checkout so you can get more sales. So again, this company has grown very fast. The, the biggest issue for this company is the, the, the level of growth. As they grow faster, they need more capital. So you can see they've, they've raised money. And to, to really get the next leg now, they really need major bank funding. So that's a re real key element we're watching for. Because as they grow, the cash is getting soaked up. And again, it's a relatively new company, so I think the banks are waiting just to see if they've got a, a history on their book, see, see what percentage default, um, and just get some learning so they can get some more comfort around how much they lend to Afterpay. But again, that's had a tremendous run. Um, and again, like Chris was mentioning, the small to mid-cap space still looks expensive. And we think if there is a correction, that's where you're going to get the most pain, is into that small to mid-caps, because they're on a P of, like Chris said, around 18 times, whereas the general market is around 15.6 times. So again, I just caution around valuations. So this is the top 10 holdings within the group. So you can see that the list there, and on the right-hand side is the funds which own those stocks. 
So the first one I'll talk about is Eclipse Group and, and why, why do we own that? Part of the investment process of Wilson Asset Management is around rating management, then the valuation and then the positioning in the industry with a catalyst. So management, we know them very well. They used to be the ex um, C-suite of Flexi Group. So we've had a very good history with these guys and they've made us a lot of money. So the management rate very well. And then on the earnings side, this business was taken over from private equity and they've actually written a lot of new business. So we think this new business will start flowing through their accounts. And Eclipse Group is a finance leasing company, so for, for cars in particular. So with, a, with the lease contract, the majority of the profit is earned at the end of the lease, around year three, year four. About 25% is that end of lease. So you're actually cycling all this new business written by the new management team over the next few years. So we think the end of lease income over the next three to four years, you'll get a significant pickup. And we think they can grow at double digits um, for the next five years. So we're quite positive on this stock. And then the position in the industry, we think these guys are the smartest operators and they have the lowest funding costs, in our view, in the industry, which gives them a tremendous advantage. So they can bid really competitively and then they can finance the vehicles at a lower cost. And they do this through various warehouse agreements with banks and the very smart operators, Gary McLennan, the, the CFO, is ex-HSBC and ex-Flexi uh, Group and he's done this in previous lives and he's very good at it, probably the best in the market. So again, it ticks a lot of boxes for us and the catalysts we think are those earnings upgrades. As they cycle through these new business writings, we think there'll be um, big upgrades to earnings over the next few years. The other stock we'll talk about is Aurora. So Aurora's just in WAM leaders. Aurora was spun out of Amcor. And again, if I walk through the investment process, management are top rate. They, they deliver what they say. They're ex, um, they come out of the Amcor mod, where Amcor are very good. They tell you exactly what's going on. They always give you updates through the market. So you always know what's going on. And Aurora are very much like this. They've got the same discipline in place. Earnings growth, again, we think they can grow double digit. And this is mainly through acquisition. They have a very small business in the US at the moment. They've just tested the waters there and they've flagged to the market they want to grow the US business. So we think they can make two to three acquisitions in the US within the next 12 months. Again, it's a very defensive business. So Aurora do packaging. Um, and even during the GFC, they managed to grow their earnings. It's a very defensive quality business, this one. So we, we rate them quite high. The other one I'll talk about there is ALS Limited. ALS Limited, they do a lot of the samples for mining companies. The reason why we like this is at the start of the year, China implemented one of the, well, actually the biggest stimulus the world has ever seen. That is why commodity prices are going up at the moment. Both fiscal and monetary policy in China was loosened. Within the Chinese economy in the last 12 months, 4.5 trillion of debt has been issued, which is more than the US, Japan and Europe combined. The government have thrown everything at this economy to get it going again. And that's why commodities have run. So a direct beneficiary of this is ALS. So at the moment, we've seen the company, it's on a relatively high PE, but we think the earnings will catch up over the next 12 to 18 months. We're hearing a lot of volume going through the, through the facilities. Um, the company has communicated that they're growing uh, employee numbers. So it gives you real insight to actually the volume going through there is really, really strong. And the feedback from a lot of the mining companies is they're starting to spend more money as they've raised a lot of money, particularly in the gold area. Um, and this is certainly coming through right now. We're going to have to be very good on timing on this because this China stimulus has the starting to wind back now. So the Chinese government are pulling back levers to try and cool the economy. But we think the, glow, the afterglow from the stimulus will continue probably for another six months. So this will be a trading position. We'll be in and out of it. I'll hand over now to John Ayub, who'll run through some stock stories and, and the rest of the team. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, and good morning, everyone. I've got the easy job. I get to just talk about one that won last year. Um, I'll start with Main Pharma, which is probably the best performing stock in our research portfolio in all your portfolios for last year. As you can see from the presentation behind me, we started buying a position in Main Pharma in January 2015, around that 62 cents mark. 
And come June 30 this year, we started to sell that position and we exited around $1.94. If I take a step back and think of when we first, uh, we were first attracted to the main story and what, what, what actually fit into the process, there were three main things. Firstly, management. Secondly, future acquisitions. And thirdly, valuation. Touching on, the, touching on the first point on management, the CEO, Scott Richards, is probably one of the more entrepreneurial CEOs in the marketplace. He had vast experience working with a number of the large global uh, pharma groups, and he clearly, from day one, had kind of identified an opportunity for Maine and the rest of the, rest of the team to forge out a business where, where they'd find orphaned or um, underperforming drugs or drug portfolios from these majors, and then, in turn, Improve the, improve the sales, the efficacy, and a number of other things, and grow the category. So for us, it was pretty clear from day, day one that management had the, the skill set and the ambition, but it was a matter of execution. So if we, if we then fast forward to, the, to, to part two of why we liked it, and around acquisitions. In, um, the initial opportunity came from Maine in, in February 2015, when they identified the Dorix brand. Um, and we, we liked this deal, and, and it was the first major acquisition we thought uh, for Maine that was kind of which, which, which set up their foundations for the growth of the business. Now we, we liked that deal because a we thought Maine could do a superior job of a selling the drugs, um, b distributing and improving the efficacy of the drugs um, than, than its previous owners, where it was basically just orphaned and forgotten about amongst a portfolio of, of much larger drugs. So for us. Scott and his team executed that deal fantastically well, uh, and from there it kind of provided the stepping stone to future acquisitions. And for us, it was, it was pretty clear from, from subsequent um, investor presentations that they'd released that they, were, they, 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 they had, had the confidence, and from there, that was a matter of buying a number of these larger scale acquisitions. So what do we do as part of our process? We wanted to get comfort um, that Maine had a, the, the, the right people in the US, B, they had the infrastructure in place to, for this rapid growth that, that they were about to be set upon. So in, I think it was September of last year, Chris and Martin Hickson and myself in a previous role, we hopped on a plane and went to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, it's a bit out of the way, but you know, certainly worth the trip. Uh, and what we found when we got there was A, there was, they, they'd, they'd inherited and invested in, in, in a sales force which was superior to none. Oh, sorry, superior to all. I shouldn't say superior to none. Um, and the infrastructure they had in place and, and the manufacturing capabilities put them into good stead where they could easily absorb any size acquisition going forward. So for us, it was pretty clear that they had the world class facilities, um, they had the sales force and the management, uh, the management team to, 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 to take that next step. And that kind of played out, um, that catalyst played out in June of this year when they bought um, a, a large portfolio of divested drugs from the T Allergen deal and T and Allergen, two major players in, in the global market who, who came together and the FDA had forced a, a portion of their portfolio to be divested. So from that perspective, the opportunity came, they, they pounced, they had this exclusive relationship, so they, they, they went through the, the portfolio and it was clear that they were getting a great opportunity. So they bought this uh, in, for around about $888 million from memory um, and it was, a, it, was a trans, it was a company transforming acquisition. So I'll touch on the deal again in a second, but and, and just just rounding off to the third point, why it fit into our process and why we liked it, it was on valuation. So at the time, uh, Maine was trading around 10 times PE, was not very well understood and, 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 and under, under, under researched from the from the from the broken community. So for us, this kind of gave us that edge that we always look for. So moving forward from there, then early this year, so why did we sell it? And coupling the, all the points together, well, firstly, post the the, the T Allergen acquisition. Um, it started to trade on 25 times PE. It became somewhat of a market darling of many of the, many of the, the large, um, large cap portfolios hunting down this space trying to find alpha. And this kind of clearly, for us, you know, a lot of the catalysts and a lot of the reasons that we liked it had played out. So it was a great deal. It worked and, and we were all very happy for that. But just a couple of side notes on it. And you know, that main, the deal that they did, you know, it, it was a transformational deal. And for us, the market fully valued had fully valued all the synergies or any benefits that come way too soon. So for our perspective, we still think Maine are well equipped to handle this process, but the valuation uplift, the market attributed way too much too quickly. So from that perspective, you know, we look at the backdrop of deals like um, the one that Primary Symbian did a number, number of years ago and the Slater Gordon Quindell deal. It just adds a level of complexity that we can't understand, we don't have an edge on. And we, you know, in this instance, we took profits and we moved on. Um, and just the last little point I'll touch on is that on the day of the deal that was released, uh, it was completed on June 30 of this year. You know, we, we saw some price action that day, which we probably had, many of us hadn't seen before. Where post deal, the, the, the post the raising, um, the stock came on a 35% premium to its last close and a 56% premium to that to the entitlement stock that we received. So, 
from that perspective, you know, we saw that full valuation come through and we took advantage of it. So on reflection, Maynard was a great stock for WAM, for, for, for WAX and leaders. And again, it was a great example of us growing with a company from its, infant, from its early, early days, growing as man's, management transitioned to a top 100 portfolio stock. And then we also built great relationships with the brokers that helped through this whole process. So again, great stock for the portfolios. Um, and I'll, t I'll leave it then. I'll pass on to Tobias here to touch on the next two stocks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tobias Yao. Today, I'll be going through a couple of stock stories. And we'll begin with one, an example of something that didn't work. Most of you are probably very familiar with this company, the Reject Shop. They have about 330 uh, discounted variety stores in Australia. You would typically go into one of these stores to look for bargains. You know, maybe sort of cheap everyday products, maybe Christmas decorations, and maybe while you're at it, treat yourself to a box of chocolates. Obviously, obviously it's something I haven't done in the past. The business model is to drive foot traffic into the stores. And when the customers come into the stores, hopefully they'll buy other products. Given the space they're in, um, there's volatility in the underlying margins because they are very exposed to the currency movements and the majority of their profits comes during the uh, Christmas period, so in December. Going back a couple of years, uh, we identified the reject shop as a potential uh, turnaround story uh, given the change in the CEO. Turnarounds are typically very tough. However, the reason we look at it is because the potential upside uh, is very attractive. And consistent with our investment process, we need a catalyst for us to look at these sort of opportunities. And that came in the change in the CEO. A new CEO could potentially reinvigorate the business. Um, and then all we have to do as investors is to just assess whether his vision and his strategy is sound. And we can assess a lot of the other factors as well as the likelihood of the turnaround as well and the, um, the time frame. In this case, we met with management in November 2014 just to get a sense of what went wrong previously. However, we didn't buy the stock because we wanted to get more comfort around some of the uh, restructuring initiatives. Following the result in FY15, um, as you can see, we started buying the stock uh, with a view that management has a good chance uh, of um, turning this business around. Um, we, th we thought the strategy was very prudent and very sound because it focused on firstly cost cutting, optimizing the cost structure, uh, and that included sort of closing down underperforming stores and going through every single one of the um, line items and the P&L to figure out how they can minimize cost. At the same time, um, they got a new buying team to come in. New buying teams are very important to drive like-for-like -like sales and the profitability of each of the stores um, because you sort of put the right products onto the shelf and people will buy it. The CEO, Ross Sedano, had a very good track record as a retailer previously as well, and that's very important to us. Uh, which is looking at the CEO. Over the next 12 to 16 months, you can probably see on the graph there, the, um, the operating metrics improved, and as a result, the market got more comfort that the turnaround is working. Um, so we, did, we actually did quite well out of the stock. However, the full year result recently in August uh, saw a slowdown like for like sales, and the share price as a result fell when people realized the turnaround uh, could potentially take longer than expected. While management has done a really good job in some of the internal initiatives, what actually happened is the competitive environment got a lot more intense uh, with um, you know, the supermarkets and the discounted department stores being more aggressive in the, uh, in the market. As a result, we exited our position because we couldn't identify any more catalysts. And, and that discipline is, is core to our investment process. If we can't um, find catalysts to re-rate the share price, we will exit the position. While the overall investment was, was in fact quite profitable for us, we did make a few mistakes and these included you know, not selling out when the market has priced in a bullish case for a turnaround story and at the same time we could have been more aggressive um, in exiting the position uh, post the downgrade. It is very important for us to learn from our mistakes uh, and um, as a team we sit down uh, all the time to go through our winners and losers to figure out how we can better improve as investors um, and, and this way, hopefully, we can continue to generate superior returns for our shareholders.
Turning to the next slide, uh, Armadale Investment Corporation is a stock that we currently like. This is actually a stock that Jeff presented at the recent uh, Sone Hearts and Mind conference. Um, for those of you ha that haven't seen the article that summarized sort of the um, uh, Jeff's presentation and some of the other stock stories, please speak to one of the uh, guys here today and hopefully we can point you in the right, right direction. Uh, Armadale is an asset finance broker trying to consolidate uh, a very fragmented market, very much like uh, sort of mortgage brokers and insurance brokers have done in the past in their respective segments. Finance brokers uh, help small and medium businesses uh, obtain access to funding for their capital expenditure. So for things like plant and equipment fixtures, uh, IT servers, and even sort of uh, commercial motor vehicles. The Australian asset finance market is about $42 billion in terms of annual origination, and 60% of that is through the broker channel. The asset-based finance and leasing industry is very important to the economy as it actually funds 40% of the nation's capital expenditure. Armadale's market share currently is around 7%, and we think there's a, a lot of scope for growth and a lot of scope for consolidating the market. These businesses are often self-fulfilling, um, so essentially the, lar the larger you get, the more economies of scale, um, the better the bargaining power uh, when you negotiate with the financing companies, and the better the offering you can provide to your uh, underlying members and underlying clients. When we look to invest in consolidation stories, having tangible synergy is quite important to us because it provides a margin of safety to us as investors. Uh, this is in contrast to a lot of the other consolidation stories where it's purely based on valuation arbitrage between sort of valuation expectations of the listed environment and also the unlisted environment. As part of our investment process, uh, a key and the core input is assessing management. Um, and we believe the joint managing directors have both a sound track record and complementary skills. So Andrew has, been, has had extensive experience in the financing space uh, in the last 30 years. He knows the industry back to front. And Cameron is the ex-chief operating officer of Steadfast, the largest insurance broking group in Australia. And he's actually been through this journey before consolidating the insurance broking market. Finally, in terms of what are the potential catalysts, um, you know, we think simplifying the corporate structure is a very good start, as you may have seen the recent ASX announcement for uh, Armadale. Um, the previous list investment company structure didn't appropriately value the intrinsic value of the operating business. Other potential catalysts could be sort of a further EPS accretive acquisitions and then getting the synergies um, after that. The company is currently trading on around 13, 14 times P, growing at 25%, and is a company that we like and that we follow very closely. Thank you very much, and I'll pass it on to Martin Hickson, who will talk about another stock that we like. Thank you, Tobias, and good morning, everybody. Another business which we expect to perform very strongly over the coming 12 months is Nick Scarley. And it's a company that we're currently a substantial shareholder in. Nick Scarley are a furniture retailer operating two major brands, the Nick Scarley brand, as well as the lower tier or low end sofas to go brand. Um, we've been following this company for a number of years and we've been shareholders in the past. However, we were never able to, uh, to build up a meaningful position in the company. That changed in March this year. And what occurred was the Scarley family which held 50% of the shares in Nick Scarley, some of the members of that family decided to sell down their positions. So that was our opportunity to buy a large slab of stock at a discount. The shares were trading at $4, and that uh, trade was done at $3.80, a 7% discount to the current share price. And what also gave us comfort in buying those shares off the Scarley family was that the CEO, Anthony Scarley, also took that, opp also took that opportunity to increase his holding in the company. So why did we buy it, or what were the catalysts that we thought could re-rate the share price? Well, the first was the management team. We rated the management team of Nick Scarley very highly, and it was led by the CEO, Anthony Scarley. Now, he's the son of the founder, Nick Scarley, and he's been working in the business for a number of years. He works at both the strategic level, so identifying new store opportunities, but also helps the buying team on, per on, what, on what furniture to buy. Um, so we've, we rate him as a very, very good retailer and probably one of the best retailers in Australia. So it ticked that box. Another catalyst was the store rollout program. 
When I started working at WAM six years ago, I still remember Matthew Kidman telling me that you always want to buy a retailer when it's in that growth phase, when it's rolling out new stores, because that obviously adds to the earnings of the business. Currently, Nick, Sc Nick Scully has 47 stores. They've got 42 Nick Scully branded stores and five Sofas to Go stores. They've announced in their recent presentations a long-term target of 75 stores. So as they roll out those new stores and increase store numbers by 50% over the next four to five years, that's going to add to the earnings of the business and provide a, a significant tailwind for earnings growth. Thirdly, they're taking market share. So three years ago, Nick Scarley only had 0.8% of the total furniture and homewares market, whereas today it's 1.5%. So they've been able to grow their market share in that category by over 30%. However, it's still only 1.5%, so it's a highly fragmented category. So we believe that as they continue rolling out stores and taking market share, they can continue growing the earnings of the business. Fourthly, in a recent presentation in August, they announced that they were looking for strategic growth opportunities. Now, we believe that this could include acquisitions, so there's a potential for the company to make earnings accretive acquisitions, which again will add to the earnings of the business. So each of these catalysts or events we think will lead to possible earnings upgrades over the coming one to two years. Trading on a PE of 14 times with EPS growth of 20% and a net cash balance sheet, we believe that there's the potential for the company to continue re-rating over the coming years. So that concludes the presentation. I'll now invite Alex up onto the stage to moderate the Q&A session. Um, and I'll also get each of the investment team to come up on stage to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, Kate, you're standing. I'd like to start with you. Um, what is Wilson Asset Management's succession plan? Thanks, Alex. Always a good question. Uh, and most of you, look, look I'll start by saying, a, a, to me, a good succession plan is not only setting the business up to future-proof it for, for many years to come and well beyond everyone here in this room, but also, obviously, to plan for unexpected events. And um, we've all heard Jeff's timeline. He Ideally, would like to retire when he's 80, but since doing the future generation vehicles, he's been told he shouldn't retire at all for his mental health. So I'm not sure what that means for all of us. But look, to me, it's, it's business as usual in, in the event that something does go wrong. Um, I've, as we sort of said earlier, I've been with the business 12 years. Chris has been with the business over 10 years. There's quite a, a number of us that have, that have been in the business a long time. And... When Jeff set up the business almost two decades ago, it was just himself um, and sort of two investors. There's now you know, a, a team of 20. There's a very strong culture that's um, developed over the years. And uh, you know, the way we invest, the way we do business, I think is very, very well established. And um, hopefully we'll go on for, you know, for many, many decades and, and many more years to come. So. Um, you know, another thing that we do is also we want to sort of spend time on, you know, looking for who the future leaders are in the business and ensuring that we sort of mentor and develop um, and sort of spend as much time as we can uh, doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, so, Jeff, here's a question for you. Uh, can you provide an update on our positions in Hunter Hall, HHY and Century, please? Hey, look, thanks, Alex. Um, and just on Kate's answer, the, my flippant answer is, yeah, what happens... I know everyone's important as, as each other in the organisation, but from mine, if I'm not around, well, there's nothing for me to worry about. Um, the, um, but in terms of, you know, just, just reiterating, you know, Kate runs the people. Uh, Chris is responsible for the money in terms of the investment side. 
um, and I've just got flexibility to do what I like doing. Um, in terms of the, the, those three companies, I, I suppose there's a bit of movement um, in Century Australia. You know, uh, Wilson Asset Man Century Australia had their AGM yesterday. Wilson Asset Management or entities own about 30 per cent of it. Um, and at the AGM yesterday, it was announced that uh, Wilson Asset Management or one of its entities has put a proposal to the Century Board um, along the same lines as the proposal we put in, ja in January this year. Um, in January this year, we're going to use Century as the vehicle to create WAM leaders because it had a you know, little under $30 million of tax losses. Um, and the proposal we're putting to Century is pretty much the, uh, the same, is we will manage the money. It's about oh, 78 million of assets. Um, we'll allow shareholders to get out at NTA if they want to, and the shareholders that want to stay in, then we'll manage it. And we'll manage it in a similar way um, you know, to leaders, um, focused more on larger companies uh, and trying to manage the pool of capital so we can utilise the tax losses. At Century, uh, Hunter Hall Global. Um, you know, th these are these are three of probably 15 listed investment companies we own shares in. Uh, and, and what we've done is, with listed investment companies, we've bought shares at a um, at usually a discount to NTA. We started buying Hunter Hall Global at a 20% discount to NTA. Now it's trading within a, cent, a percent or two of NTA, uh, and we've been selling selling a few later, lately. Um, and the last one is Hastings High Yield Fund, HHY. And that's really, um, we've put up uh, a, um, we've called an EGM and we're going to hold it ourselves at, at, at our cost. Um, because we're really disappointed with what they did. We called an EGM for them to hold, uh, to change the RE, because the question was, do you want, you know, well, do you want the RE that's there, Aurora? managing the money and yeah you know, for legal reasons what can I say but yeah you know, I mean that's our, our decision was another RE would do a better job um, and, and we won the vote but it, but unfortunately it never got to a vote because half an hour beforehand yeah you know, they announced uh, using one of our other entities a takeover and you know, so the, and one of the conditions was the RE doesn't change so we we're really disappointed with that so we said look we'll run out own meeting. And it's really, um, I mean, to me it's important for everyone to try to keep, um, keep everyone honest in the corporate world. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Um, for Chris, uh, Wilson Asset Management is growing in size. How is this affecting the way that we invest? Thanks very much, Alex. And it's a good question. It's a question we get quite often, particularly the last few years, with the group funds under management growing from 300 million to over 2 billion today. Uh, the key point to make to you is there's been no change to the way that we manage our money. There's been no change to the investment process, and we don't expect there to be any changes to how we manage the money or the investment process. Everybody, every fund manager's got their own black box, a way they think they can beat the share market. And the process, particularly for WAM Capital that we've got in place, has delivered 18%. Uh, return per annum, outperforming the all ordinaries by 10 per cent per annum uh, over eight, almost 18 years. So I think it would be silly to, to change it. Um, in terms of what, how, we've re, how, how we've tweaked day-to-day uh, -day what we do, um, the main one would be on the dealing side when we're looking to buy or sell stocks. Going back five years ago, if we were to find a new investment in the portfolio, it would represent a 1% weighting, and we'd have to buy maybe $1 to $2 million worth of stock. Where we could sit in the market and just acquire shares very quietly, um, maybe over a week or two. Nowadays, with the, with the growth in the funds under management, if we wanted to put a 1% investment uh, into the portfolio, it, could, it ranges anywhere from 15 to 20 to $25 million, depending on which of the funds is, 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 uh, is buying or selling. So, in essence, what we've done is we, we on the dealing side now, we're, we're trading more in block lines of stock where we can ring a broker and we can say we'd like to buy size, a parcel of that particular share, and we can transact in, in, 
in a block line very, very quickly. Uh, and it's being and Martin Hickson, who's on the stage here, who does a lot of the dealing, has done a fantastic job and continues to do so in terms of um, executing those trades and getting us the best possible price and the best possible outcome for shareholders. So no, no change in the investment process. We won't change the investment process. Uh, and we've just made some slight tinkering around the edges in terms of we talked about the dealing to deal with the larger funds under management. Thanks, Chris. And just another question for you. Um, the financial year 2016 saw record performance, uh, which incurred higher management and performance fees. Can you explain what this means for shareholders? Thanks, Alex. And it's a good question, and it's a question we get quite often on our fees. Uh, when the business was set up, as Jeff spoke about in the AGM, the, the business was set up with a 1% management fee and a 20% performance fee, which is incurred where we do outperform the share market, where the manager gets 20% of the outperformance and shareholders get 80% of the outperformance. And that's the structure in place. And what we tend to find is people that have looked into this issue is that when they, they adjust our numbers for fees and compare it to some of our competitors, particularly in the LIC space, that are on, on face value charge lower fees, uh, our, our, our performance stacks up very, very well when compared to not only our listed investment company peers, but also when you're comparing us to some other unit trust uh, structures or other funds out there that are a non-LIC structure. Uh, so in essence, we're, we're paid to perform. We're all incentivised. We're highly motivated to perform uh, and to continue to, continue to drive uh, superior returns for shelters over the longer term. Thanks, Chris. Um, Matt, question for you. Can you provide an update on WAM leaders, please? Thanks, Alex. Um, WAM leaders um, listed uh, 30th of May, um, and we began deploying the cash over the, the next few months following that. Um, we became fully invested, and fully invested for us is you know between 20 and 30 per cent cash. Um, generally. So that happened around second week of August. Currently the portfolio has 38 stocks in there. We have a cash weighting of 21%, uh, which is a bit lower than the other funds due to that rotation Chris mentioned before, which we saw happen in earnest in October where a lot of money has moved from the small to mid caps into large caps. So our focus um, now has, has switched to those larger companies. We're still predominantly uh, outside the top 50, but our top 50 holdings have increased a lot. So currently, like I said, yeah, 21% cash, um, and the portfolio is set up quite well now going forward. Um, we have 2.7 cents in the profit reserve, so we have the ability to pay a dividend, and we have 0.5 cents of franking, so there is a little bit of franking there as well. So. Obviously, a di dividends are a bore decision, so that will be made in February of, of next year. Thanks, Matt. And just one last one for you. Um, what is your view on the banks? Uh, how long do we have, Alex? Um, very topical question, and I guess a lot of people have uh, banks in their portfolios as well. Um, when we were doing our roadshow for WAM leaders, we were a little bit negative on the banking sector. That's changed quite remarkably over the past few months. And probably the biggest change that happened for us was only two Fridays ago uh, when Wayne Byers was giving a speech at, uh, I think it was a Finzia conference. And he talked about Basel IV. And then he talked about the capital required under this new Basel committee would be a lot less than you think. But the Australian banks will definitely have to hold above the minimum but his language was quite soft, and people took this as, a, as a, a very good measure for the Australian banks, that the capital impulse won't be as large as you think. And then also, the consultation period may go on as, as long as 12 to 18 months. So if a bank holds more capital, their return on equity goes down. So it's quite a bad thing if you get a heavy hit of capital. So um, we think the Australian banking sector now has a decent chance to generate enough capital organically and through underwritten DRPs to meet the, the Basel IV requirements. We still haven't seen the Basel IV requirements, but they're all starting to leak out now. We'll have clarity by the end of this calendar year. And then in March of next year, um, um, APRA will go and put their definition of unquestionably strong out to the marketplace and work through the process. So it's still a ways off, but the early signs are the capital uh, requirements won't be as large as people thought. 
And on that day that came out, you would have seen all the major banks were up quite a lot. NAB, I think, hit 4% that day. And that's just one of the overhangs from the banking sector that's been removed. And then if we walk through the other headwinds, which are now turning to tailwinds, so a lot of the banks are taking cost out now. So a lot of them have mentioned um, that they're looking through their branch network, closing down unprofitable branches, um, all that money they've invested in technology, now they're starting to pull out costs. ANZ have been the most um, direct, I guess, uh, through um, firing people. I think they're, they're up almost 5,000 people have, have gone, so it's been quite dramatic, um, some of the efforts there. But you can see their jaws will start to improve from here on in. And another thing is interest rates. So interest rates look like on hold now. When interest rates go down, this is really negative for banks because your deposits are effectively nothing and your loan um, interest rates will come down, you get squeezed and the net interest margin comes under pressure. Now we're on hold and the, if interest rates go up, that is really positive for the banks. So we think that dynamic has changed too because if you read through the RBA minutes, they're quite clear that they don't want to push rates down lower. The effectiveness of pushing down below 1.5 um, it's quite minimal. So I don't think there's any um, more risks that we have interest rate cuts unless we get some sort of shock event. So again, that, that has cleared up as well. And then if we walk through the bad and doubtful debts, uh, they've been quite stable. Um, there's particular pockets in Australia that are, are negative, particularly WA. WA has deteriorated a lot in the housing market, but everywhere else it's, it's held quite well. And you actually seen some of the 90 day delinquencies improve. So we don't think, barring an unforeseen event, you're going to get a tick up in bad and doubtful debt. So all those combination of factors make us more positive around the Australian banks. Thanks, Matt. So this now concludes the moderated Q&A and the formal presentation. Thank you to those who were watching via the live stream or video recording.